Here we are in St Lawrence's Church, uh, Chorley, and in normal times there would have been a physical exhibition here depicting the life of Miles Standish. Now, uh, what we are going to have is a virtual exhibition and this video to go along to explain uh, what the exhibition is about. We don't know a great deal about Miles Standish, uh, born anywhere between 1583 and 1587, uh, experienced as a soldier in the Netherlands with the English army, uh, but shot into fame through being the military advisor with the Pilgrim Fathers who sailed on the Mayflower in 1620. He himself settled in uh, what became America. He died in 1656 and his will of 1655 is really important. Now, there are many issues about Miles Standish. And the first one is, where did he hail from? Where was he born? Who was his family? And we're starting in St Lawrence's because here we have a Standish pew. And it's the Standish of Duxbury pew, put in in about 1600 by Alexander Standish of Duxbury. And what's really interesting is that in 1632, Miles moved away from uh, New Plymouth and set up his own farm and his own settlement at Duxbury in New England. And he called that Duxbury, well, he must have done that for a reason. So the people of Chorley and St Lawrence's in particular uh, do feel an association with Miles Standish. Here, for example, you see an art competition mooted by the Friends of St Lawrence's Chorley and there is a depiction of the Mayflower on its voyage in 1620, 400 years ago. This is the old 15th century chancel of St Lawrence's Chorley and in that chancel you have the monuments to the Standish family of Duxbury. Thing was though, in 1812, the last of the real Standishes of Duxbury, uh, Sir Frank, died in London and then it was a question of finding cousins who might have a claim to the estate. Um, first of all there was Frank Hall Standish, who came from uh, Durham in uh, 1812, uh, and then in 1840 when he died, uh, it was a gentleman called William Carr of Cockham Hall near Durham who came. Very wisely he uh, took upon himself to have new names, call himself William Standish. Standish. Uh, but some people thought that, well, perhaps this wasn't quite right, and there were lots of other claimants to, to the Duxbury estate at that time. And one man came from America, a man called Mr. Bromley in 1846, uh, and he was representing descendants of Miles Standish in America. And not surprisingly, they were very keen to claim a share of the 6,000 acre Duxbury estate. Now, I visited this church in 1846 and demanded to see the parish registers. And on looking at the parish registers, he found that for 1583-84 there were several pages defaced. One in particular, it looked very much like the cleric of the time had been using a pumice stone to give himself some extra space or new space to write some records on. But Mr Bromley claimed that Miles Standish's birth had been rubbed out, Miles Standish's baptism had been rubbed out because people at the time were surreptitiously detaining his estates. And we'll hear more about surreptitiously detaining 
shortly. Now we're at Duxbury Hall, surely. Uh, well, we could say where Duxbury Hall was because as you look at the lawns in front of us, we're right bang middle in where the hall stood. Uh, the stable building with the, uh, the cupola on top, you can see probably from about 1780. And behind there, behind the high wall, is the old barn, which was the first uh, building at Duxbury from just before 1600. And this was the home of the Standishes of Duxbury. Remember, Miles named his own settlement in America, Duxbury. Uh, I wonder, he came back to England uh, to try and raise money for the Pilgrim Fathers in 1625. And we have a stone uh, from a build of uh, the Duxbury Hall dated 1623. I wonder if he heard about that and I wonder if he thought, well, yeah, my antecedents might well be the Standishes of Duxbury Hall. So, a last look at the stable block at Duxbury Hall, Chorley. The thing is, uh, Miles could have been related to the Standishes of uh, Duxbury, but there were six branches of the uh, Standish family, at least six branches locally, uh, and Miles caused some confusion because in his will of 1655, he didn't refer to Duxbury at all. I'll read you his will. It gives us some clues. I give unto my son and heir apparent, Alexander Standish, all my lands as heir apparent by lawful descent, in Ormistick, Boscoing, Wrightington, Maudsley, Newborough, Crawston, and the Isle of Man, and given to me as a right heir by lawful descent, but surreptitiously detained from me, my great-grandfather being a second or younger brother from the house of Standish of Standish, March the 7th, 1655, by me. Miles Standish. Moved away from uh, Duxbury now um, because I did say there were certainly about six local branches of the Standish of Standish family. Now if you remember the will we've uh, just read out, Miles was adamant in 1655 that he was uh, from the house of Standish of Standish. And uh, the building we've looked at, Lower Burg Hall here, belonged to a branch of the Standish family of Lowerberg, and actually uh, some of the founders of that family would certainly feature as being a second or younger brother from the house of Standish of Standish, so that would fit another uh, reference in the will. So the Standishes of the Lowerberg uh, could be, well be the uh, family that Miles was related to. The interesting thing about the Lower Burg Hall that you see that it is one of the, well, perhaps the only building actually left standing in Chorley that dates back uh, to the time that Miles Standish might have been born. That is apart from St Lawrence's Church. This is the beautiful uh, perpendicular Standish Parish Church. Uh, I say perpendicular, it was actually built in uh, 1585, roughly about the time, of course, that Miles Standish was born. And he was absolutely adamant, I am a Standish of Standish. And of course, Standish inevitably uh, was the mother and father of all the other Standish families and estates round about. And we can find a second or younger son who could have been his great-grandfather if we look at the time scale round about 1500. We also find lots of Alexanders in the Standish of Standish family tree. And Miles himself named his, uh, not his first son, but his surviving first son, Alexander. So was he in fact a Standish of the root branches of the Standish? About a mile and a half from uh, St Wilfrid's uh, Church Standish is Standish Hall Farm. So called because it stands next to where Standish Hall itself was, built in 1573. 
So uh, Miles, if he was from these parts, would probably know it. Uh, the last of the Standish to Standish um, died out in about 1820. Uh, the hall was uh, into uh, rent and eventually auction and was demolished in the 1980s. But it could have been the ancestral home of Miles Standish because he was insistent in his will that he was a Standish of Standish. The final site we want to look at in relation to Miles' origins is the Isle of Man. Now this could be the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea because the branch of the Standishes of Standishes was established uh, from Ormskirk uh, in Ellenbane in the Isle of Man. And it could just so be that uh, Huon Standish of Ormskirk and then the Isle of Man was a younger son of the Standish of Standish um, and that could be Miles great-grandfather. There is a gap in the Isle of Man Standish records of an unnamed child and it has been supposed that that was Miles. Uh, unfortunately it's much more likely to have been uh, a young man named after his elder brother who had uh, died. However, the uh, nameplate that you're looking at now, the Isle of Man Farm, is not in the Irish Sea at all, but uh, just west of Chorley and Standish, on the outskirts of Croston. And if I remind you uh, that in his will, uh, Miles mentioned that he was uh, heir apparent to land in Ormskirk, Burscoe, Wrightington, Maudsley, Newborough, Croston and the Isle of Man. Well, this could be the Isle of Man that he was referring to. Standish of Ormskirk lands, all fairly well listed in Miles' uh, account. Turning away from the Isle of Man farm nameplate and looking in the opposite direction, you get some idea why the farm was named the Isle of Man, because uh, after yesterday's heavy rain, you can see a lake in front of us and the various bits of higher land of which this is one poking above the general landscape. We return to the 15th century chancel of St Lawrence's Church Chorley after our tour of sites possibly linked to our hero Miles Standish. Uh, was he a Standish of Duxbury? Because he called his settlement in America Duxbury and the Standishes of Duxbury were associated with this church? Or was he, as he claimed, a direct Standish of Standish? Or just possibly a Standish of Ormskirk and the Isle of Man, whichever Isle of Man that may be? Uh, finally, possibly a Standish of the Lower Burg, who also were a branch of the Standish family. It's very hard to be definitive. Um, there is some DNA evidence already. Miles' uh, descendants contain a Y chromosome in their genetic makeup, which is unique to, to Lancashire. And a gentleman who can trace his uh, family tree back to before 1700, a local gentleman, um, has had quite recently DNA tested against Standish descendants in America, and there is a 24 to 25 match. But which branch of the Standish family? If we delve beneath this crypt and did a DNA test on the Standishes of Duxbury and looked at that match, that would be fairly informative, or perhaps at St Wilfrid's in Standish. For the time being, we have to say we don't know. Possibly Miles himself did not know. Perhaps the fact that he seems somewhat confusing when he referred to Duxbury, and then in his will referred to Standish of Holmskirk lands and Standish of Standish, perhaps he was casting around a little 
and sure of his own origins, apart from the fact he found himself in a military camp in the Netherlands in the 1590s or early 1600s, and perhaps he was hoping for the best. Someday, somebody may come across a parish record, or there may be a definitive DNA test. That's for the future. So we have dealt with one of the main issues concerning Miles Standish, uh, the whereabouts of his origins. There are two other issues that we are seeking to explore. Uh, first of all, just how able a leader was he amongst the Pilgrim Fathers and the settlers in America who went on the Mayflower in 1620. There is some criticism. Uh, for example, um, if he had taken the original uh, search party for a site away from Cape Cod to the north or the west, he may well have founded a very prosperous settlement uh, where Boston is today. But instead he chose to follow a southerly route round Cape Cod and came to a place that wasn't quite that desirable, which eventually the pilgrims named New Plymouth. His first actions over there were not particularly praiseworthy in that he disturbed Indian uh, almost burial grounds in order to get at stores and food. And uh, he certainly disappointed some of the uh, Mayflower contingent when in 1632 he left New Plymouth to go and found his own settlement in Duxbury. Having said that, they would have been hard pushed to do without him. He was their choice as military captain and this was confirmed when they landed in America. And he was essential for giving the military training and the military dispositions that allowed this very small group of people to survive. He also proved a very courageous, honourable and convincing man when half of them went down with terrible fever in their very first winter in America. And he stood strong as a nurse, as a man who fetched supplies, as a man who was unbowed during that horrible time in which he lost his wife and many, many other people perished as well. Uh, after that he featured in 1625 coming back to try and raise more money to support the settlement. Um, he himself acted as assistant governor, as treasurer, he, he guaranteed their debt and although he went to Duxbury he remained a military advisor in some respect into the 1630s. So perhaps on balance you would judge that um, he was a good servant of uh, this fledging settlement in America. The third issue that uh, we are exploring though is a very serious one, particularly today because of contemporary events in our own century. Um, he is often criticised as being more than forthright, in fact vicious, um, towards the Native Americans that he encountered. There are two bases for, for this thesis really. First of all, if you look at the crest of the flag of Massachusetts over the last 150 years, you will see the figure of a Native American and above it you will see an arm poised with a sword. And it's often believed that this was modelled on the sword of Miles Standish and that it's to depict settlers led by Miles Standish beating down upon the head of the Native Americans. Um, in fact, the motto underneath the shield and the raised sword above the Native American were really uh, taken from the time of the American Revolution and it was a warning about defending liberty against the British government at the time. But it doesn't give Miles the best press and it's sometimes assumed that the sword is modelled upon Miles' sword in the museum at uh, New Plymouth. Secondly, he was guilty of one particular heinous, vicious, perhaps even cowardly attack upon a group of Native Americans. In 1623, the fledging settlement at New Plymouth was uh, threatened uh, by action from uh, Massachusetts Indians to the north of uh, New Plymouth. Uh, and Miles himself had been insulted and threatened a number of times. Well, being Miles, he decided on preventative action and lured with the promise of a feast uh, two in important sachems of the Massachusetts uh, groups into a uh, meeting. And with the door locked, he then set upon them, killed one leader himself 
and that day caused the death of six others. This is seen as being a particularly heinous um, event. If there is defence for that, one has to say that um, he was acting under orders from Governor Bradford um, of New Plymouth, but then again, Miles was one of his strongest advisers, so perhaps it was he who put the policy in William Bradford's head. Um, secondly, he was used to defending a group of people who had been reduced from over 100 to just 50 people in their very first year, and there was a very good chance they would be pushed into the sea. Um, after the 1622 killings in Virginia, where 347 people of uh, European origin were wiped out by Native Americans, you could perhaps understand the concern in their mind. It's furthermore worth adding that um, the seven deaths that Miles was responsible for perhaps uh, can be put into proportion by talking about the 1637 depredations and killings uh, done by other settlers in Massachusetts um, towards the Native Americans. Uh, and secondly, to compare that with what's known as King Philip's War in the 1670s when countless Native Americans were sent into slavery. And of course, Miles Standish had nothing to do with those uh, much more uh, thoroughgoing and uh, terrible events. Um, if it's any consolation too, I mean, he could be equally forthright and uh, equally uh, strong with, with anybody. And uh, Thomas Morton, an Englishman settling at Merrymount to the north of New Plymouth, found him a very brusque arresting officer when he came to carry Morton away to his punishment. So it's up to people reading their history to make their judgments. Uh, I can recommend uh, Philbrick's books on the into American wars at that time and the pilgrims role in that and eventually the pilgrims did become enmeshed in the politics of the region and the, the landed takeover that went on but in their early days they just sought to be small separate and to build a godly community and we're grateful for Mount Standish to be their military helper advisor so there we have it we wished we could give you a physical exhibition to go around and to talk to people and ask questions. For now, uh, we rely on this uh, video that we've put together to introduce the three main issues that the exhibition is addressing. Thank you very much.